It's called Throwing Rocks at the Google Bus, How Growth Became the Enemy of Prosperity. And the, the title was inspired by, I'm sure you guys remember in the late 2013, uh, protesters were lying down originally in front of the Google Bus trying to prevent their passage. You know, what, what people had realized was that their rents were going up because all of Google's employees were moving to San Francisco so they could live with cool people rather than down wherever Google was. And because they were all moving there, the rents were going up. And then Google, uh, meaning good for the world, right, to make less pollution, they created a commuter bus, you know, a free bus for their employees to go. And they use however many less tons of toxic carbon monoxide and stuff to do it. But people were noticing then that rents were going up by 30% in areas where the buses were picking people up. So people who lived there felt like this big corporation that, it, that was supposed to be on our side. These were the good guys. Remember, Yahoo was the top-down bad guys. Google was the one who was using aggregating user content in our links in order to do a sort of a bottom-up model for the organization of the world's data and all that. But they were just destroying the real world in which they lived. So I understood. And I remember the first tweets were coming through and people were saying, come on, retweet. Come on, this is great. We're bringing them down. It was right around the NSA stuff. So we were all feeling, you know, yeah, fuck Google. Um, but part of me felt, I don't know, I feel weird about the people on the bus. I know the people on the bus. Howard Rheingold's daughter is on one of those buses, you know. She's a great kid, you know, and, and the, the programmers, yeah, they're making money, but you know the kind of burnout they have? They're just trying to make enough money in the, you know, 36 months that they can work at Google before their life is, you know, literally extracted from them. <laughs> you know, they're supposed to do their laundry there and stuff. It's, it's crazy. So it's like... And then, you know, a, a few weeks later, then in Oakland, people threw rocks at the bus and broke the window. And I was trying to figure out who are we supposed to be mad at? Who is this war between? Is it the 99% against the 1%? Is it the residents of Google against these employees? Is it is the non-technological against the technological? Is it us against the shareholders? You know, and each one of these people, I realized, didn't mean to be doing harm. You know, even, even the, the people who are running Google are thinking, well, now we've got these shareholders we've got to answer, answer to, and the shareholders, quite frankly, are any one of us with a retirement plan that has an S&P 500 in it, we are those shareholders who are going to sell the damn stock if it's not going up because we've got to retire on it. So who is the enemy? And I realize it wasn't really any group of people against any other, but humanity itself against an operating system that's gone out of control, against an economy that has been optimized for growth and then put on a digital platform where its worst features end up being amplified really beyond any of our ability to do anything about it. So it's not a matter, and most people think, oh, well, digital turns out to suck, right? Digital sucks because it's fucking up our, our economy. And it's no. You know, it's not actually true. When digital first came around, if you think about the biases of digital technology, we weren't making any money with it at all. This was a shareware universe that we lived in. The thing that made the internet so confusing and sexy to, to Wall Street and the media and everybody was that we were all working for free. Right? We would make programs, you know, you, whether it was in a university or a nonprofit or in a garage, people would make programs and be satisfied just for the fact that it was distributed and being used by other people. Shareware, freeware, it was, it was an anti-economy, at least as far as, as the rules of the economy that, that we were used to. But then around 1993, 1994, Wired magazine came around and said, oh, you know what? This internet, it's not really this freeware, shareware, Mondo 2000 psychedelic fractal thing. It's the savior of the NASDAQ stock exchange, which, which had recently been you know, bankrupted by the biotech crash of 1987. The internet became the poster child for the long boom, right? For the idea that the, now that we have the internet, the economy can expand infinitely, just like the law of nature, and just like the universe will expand infinitely. Don't worry, the markets will grow. Oh, wow. That's the perfect moment for a screensaver, isn't it? <laughs> it was the screensaver. Right, so then Wired and the GBN and all of these great, uh, these great pundits talked to us about how the internet could, 
could, uh, how it would work. And basically, we know how it works. You come up with some idea, you get a ton of investment money, then you flip it, and then who cares what the idea does as long as you got your money. And I remember, I mean, it all became really clear to me the moment I saw, you know, Evan Williams, who was a friend of mine. I remember when he was starting Blogger and needed $300 to get through the weekend. I saw Evan Williams' face on the cover of the Wall Street Journal on the morning that Twitter had its IPO. And underneath his face was the number, $4.3 billion. Could you imagine just, just knowing someone who has $4.3 billion? You know, I wanted to be happy for him. <laughs> but to me, it represented the failure of Twitter. Because now Twitter, instead of being an application that helps people send 140 character messages to one another, now Twitter was the name on $50 billion of debt. You know, so this was the kid, not who, no longer the kid who provided us with an application to connect and do Arab Spring and Occupy and whatever we want to do. This is like the kid who, who was being rewarded for bringing some kind of gargantuan uh, pumpkin to the state fair. You know, it was this, this, this freakishly large, strange thing that was just, it was even wrong leverage for what the actual thing was. And now, Twitter, which makes what, $50 million a quarter? Twitter is considered an abject failure by Wall Street. Right, that's a problem. That's not the problem of the application. It's the problem of the requirement of the economy to grow. That that's the only rule that we know. But it is a bankrupt model. It is a bankrupt. It just doesn't actually work. And you can make... <laughs> and believe it or not, Wall Street, the Fortune 500, they know this. Deloitte showed in their... Uh, uh, shift index of uh, 2011, that corporate profit over net worth has been declining for over 70 years. Corporate profit over net worth. What does that mean? It means corporations are really good at collecting money, but they're really bad at deploying it. Right? And that's a problem, right? They can sit and they can get really fat and really obese. I was at a, a, a conference for a, a, a major American soft drink company. And um, they, they had said, oh, you know, our growth last year was 6.7%, uh, but next year we have to get to 7.3%. That's our goal. And they had all these executives shouting, 7.3, 7.3, 7.3. And I got up there, I was supposed to do this talk on, like, you know, uh, communications and all, and I said, Jesus Christ, if you guys aren't big enough already, then there's no hope. Right, this is one of the most giant things. If they have to grow in order to survive, then something is wrong with this picture. Right? And what, what's happened is we've taken a 13th century printing press era extractive growth-based economic operating system, and we're running it on a digital platform, and it's spinning out of control with a centrifugal force, essentially, of digital platforms accelerates, it amplifies the features of this economic model, and then you get sort of end stage uh, uh, apocalyptic style results. So I think the thing we have to do is to look at what was that economy programmed for in order to understand whether or not we want to embed those priorities, those commands, into the digital economy, which is increasingly going to be running on automatic. Right now, the first main value of the industrial age, and again, they don't really teach this in school, unless you're studying with Richard. Um, the first main value of the industrial age was to remove humans from the equation. That's what industrialism was for, right? We had, in the late Middle Ages, we had the beginnings of a peer-to-peer -peer economy. It was after the Crusades, people had come back from the wars, they had spices and technologies, they had seen the bazaar of, uh, of, of the, uh, the, the Arab bazaar, and they said, well, why don't we have marketplaces like that in our communities? And people began to trade at the market between each other, right? And they had, I mean, we can't get into it now, they had local currencies that they used, and they, were the creators and exchangers of their own value. And they started to get really wealthy. The number of days they worked went down. It was, it was a great 
an appropriate growth economy. Because these were peasants, right, who were now becoming bourgeois, you know, which we're supposed to look down on. They were becoming the middle class. Now, it was great for everyone except the aristocracy, right? The aristocracy had lived for centuries just extracting value from the work of peasants. Now the aristocracy was getting poor as the peasants were getting relatively wealthy, as the economy grew. And they looked at that and said, we've got to get some of this growth for ourselves. Right? So the industrial age mechanisms that they implemented, namely uh, corporatism and central currency were designed to stamp out the peer-to-peer -peer economy, to slow the velocity of transactions between people and get them paying up. So first, it's a, it's a slight exaggeration, but only slight, uh, small business was made illegal. Right? We invented the chartered monopoly. So now, instead of you know, me buying uh, oats from Richard, now I would have to buy oats from Her Majesty's oat maker. Instead of me buying shoes from, from Mark, I'd buy from Her Majesty's official chartered monopoly shoe company. Now the problem with this was the independent shoemaker now had to go work for Mark instead of making shoes. He didn't have his business. He had to go get a job. Right, these jobs we're all talking about, jobs were invented right around then. The only people who had jobs before that were basically slaves and apprentices. But now, we're going to have a job. So instead of me creating shoes and selling them, now I'm going to sell my time to Mark. Because now Mark got the official charter. Congratulations. So Mark got the official charter on shoes. So he gives a little bit of the investment back to the monarch. And now everybody has to work for him. And now Mark invents industrial age processes. Now does he invent them because, oh, he thinks he's going to make better shoes with these mechanical processes and having proto factories? No. What he's thinking is, do I want to hire an expensive, highly skilled craftsman to make shoes? Or do I want to go to the Home Depot parking lot and get some illegal aliens to come in at 12 cents an hour? The latter. I'll take, this. I'll take door two, Monty, right? So that's what they, I mean, they had the equivalent. They had unskilled laborers so they can bring them in, train them in 15 minutes to put one nail into a shoe, and then they can't fight back. They can't ask for higher wages. You just replace them and get another one. So industrial age processes, mass production even, was really invented to alienate the worker from the value he was creating or she was creating. Right? And now, and, and well, and it sucked. <laughs> right? So people became employees. So, and, and we know the, the, the basic media story that came from that was because now we had mass-produced goods. I wasn't buying from my friends anymore in the marketplace. I was buying something out of a plain brown box. So then they had to come up with mass marketing to humanize that box. So they put a Quaker on those oats, right? <laughs> so now I have a relationship. And to really embed that Quaker with mythology, we invented mass media. Right? Not because Lucille Ball was sitting in her cabana in Hollywood thinking, how am I going to reach the world with my comedy? No, it was so that the Quaker people could get that image into our heads before the box came and have a pre-existing relationship. So mass production led to mass marketing, which led to mass media. You know, and the second invention, which central currency, well, we know what that was about. People had market currencies that were really invented in the morning, you know, so just so that you could, you could transact. Right, so the baker who knew that he was going to sell 10 loaves of bread that day could create bread receipts that then people could use during the day. He could buy stuff, and by the time they would come back to him, he'd give a loaf of bread or, or, or settle out. But the problem with that currency is nobody was making money on that currency. It was just a utility. So the wealthy, they actually hired some good, uh, some good financial uh, advisors to figure this out. They thought, why don't we make all that currency illegal and force people instead to use you know, coin of the realm? Because now, the wealthy who had money could make money by lending out their money at interest. So now we have an operating system where you have to pay back more money than you got. How do you do that? Well, you have to have an economy that grows. You know, and this worked pretty well for a bunch of centuries of colonial expansion. As long as you had new people to take over, new slaves to, uh, new slaves to hire, um, you, you would do fine. But it, it eventually reached, it, it hit a wall. You know, and, and we'll look at that in a minute and, and, and what, what we did about that. But the two main biases then uh, uh, of, of corporatism and central currency were to remove humans from the equation. So now we have digital technology, which originally could have put humans back in the equation, right? Digital means the fingers, 
right? These are the digits. You get back. We can start creating value again. Any kid with a laptop can sit at home with his pajamas and make a thing and spread it out and Etsy and peer to peer and Burning Man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but what was the dominant form? What was the dominant use of digital technology was to continue the dehumanization of the marketplace. I mean, you look even the simplest, uh, the simplest uses when you uh, take a hi-fi set, which used to have all these little pieces that you could pull out and solder and put together, and you replace that with printed circuit boards. What have you done to the local e electrician who used to be able to fix that thing? He can no longer create value. Now, all best he can do is buy a new printed circuit board from the company. What happens when you take a car that used to, remember when cars had points and plugs and things like that? They worked. You know, what happens when you replace that with a computer? Local auto mechanic, now he's either got to get certified and pay all this money up to the corporation or just go out of business and let the corporation do it. So again, the, the person, the small businessman, the person who's creating value is replaced by corporatism. You know, or uh, uh, any, look at any example of the new mechanisms of the digital economy, whether it's, and we've all talked about, you know, the Amazon Mechanical Turk, um, or the, the winner-takes-all qualities, the, the destruction of the music industry, the book industry, the, the journalism industry, the pretty much every industry with the winner-takes-all stakes of these self-reinforcing leaderboards and recommendation systems. We end up in, a, uh, in an economy that really values the technology for its ability to extract value from economies rather than technology for its ability to help people create and exchange value between each other. And you look at Google, you know, which, which, nothing against Google, God bless you Google, uh, they could hurt you, you know, so don't, don't say anything. Um, but you look at Google and what are the, the final embedded values now that they, they hired Ray Kurzweil as their scientist. And what does he believe? He believes that humans are only important insofar as we can bring on the singularity so that the computer can think for itself. You know, that's not the value system I want at the very center of the behemoth of the digital age. Right? So humans, where do humans fit into this new economy? Really not as creators of value, but as the content. You know, we are no longer the content creators. We are the content. We are the data. You know, we are the medium, if you will. Or you use a smartphone, Right? As you use the smartphone, your smartphone gets smarter, but you get dumber. <laughs> right? It knows every stroke, every time I touch this thing, it knows more about me and my data. That's what's being extracted. You know, when Jay-Z gives us a free album and sticks it, we stick it on our phone sponsored by Samsung, it turns out that that's, he gives it to us for free because our money is not worth as much to him as the data he can then sell to Samsung, to Samsung's marketers. You know, so we are the medium. Now the thing that's bankrupt about that model is everything in this Google, in this Google data Facebook model, everything comes down to advertising and marketing. Right? But no time in history has advertising and marketing represented more than 5% of GDP. But how can we then have the entire NASDAQ stock exchange based on ad serving? It won't work. In the end, if everything's supposed to be an ad, if I, talk to, for, if I talk for the ads, if every service that we do is just for the ads that we can sell on top of it, who is left to advertise? Right? It's, it's a snake that eats its tail. Right? So we're running a digital economy on this extractive colonial economic value system. You know, and it, it worked in some sense. It worked right up until World War II when we got into post-colonialism. And that's when Eisenhower said, well, look, we're going to need another way to make this work. And they thought, technology, right? We've run out of territory, we've run out of slaves, we've run out of banana republics, but technology will increase the surface area on human beings and create a new territory, which is, you know, this human attention, you know, or human, or, or human data. And you look at the digital era companies, and they're really just running chartered monopoly software in digital form. So we all know, you know, Walmart is what? Walmart is a, is a conquistador of territories, right? They go out, they create monopolies, and then they close stores and force everyone to go further to get to it. We all know their system, right? To take over regions and extract value. Walmart's like a vacuum cleaner in that sense, right? So what's the modern equivalent is Amazon and Uber, 
right? Amazon doesn't care about books. They just want to own a vertical so then they can hop over with a, mon with a monopoly to the next one. That's the object of the game, or Uber, right? What is Uber but a, a, an effort to monopolize the taxi cab thing in order to hop over? You think driving is their thing? We all know that they're, they're going to move into, into their, their, their competition is, is UPS, for God's sake. It's the logistics of the entire planet. But in order for their models to work, they have to achieve an absolute monopoly so then they can hop over to another vertical. So where corporations used to use their charters to exercise monopoly power, now they use, as Trevor would tell us, now they use the platform to do it. So whereas before it was the law that enforced the monopoly, now it's the technology itself that enforces the monopoly. And you talk to the CEOs of these places, and luckily, I, because I don't put marks in my books, um, I, I get to do that, right? If they, see, if they can do a mark search, you're just out of the corporate loop. It's funny, but we're speaking amongst friends and you two. Um, <laughs> you talk to these guys and they'll say, well, I'd love to switch, but my shareholders are demanding growth. And that's the same thing that happens to these poor kids. They have a great idea for a startup. And then they end up, you know, they leave college when they're sophomores and take this money from some incubator or Y Combinator or whatever. They get all this money and they replace their great leftist teachers with rightist venture capitalists as their new mentors. And they learn to pivot. And pivoting means leaving the thing that you were going to do and help people and turning it into a disposable company that gets an IPO and an exit. Right? So it's not actually creative destruction, it's destructive destruction. Right? It just go and destroy a marketplace. So then you look at Twitter and you think, well, gosh, you know, Twitter, fine. So they disrupted journalism or disrupted communications, but then they go to the biggest, baddest industry of all, the one the most needing of disruption, and go, Daddy, at Goldman Sachs, get me an IPO, right? Where instead, these very same technologies could be used to disrupt those bad guys for their own good. You know? So the question then thanks, is, why are we optimizing for growth over anything else, the growth of capital? How have these companies become literally software that extracts value from the working transacting economy and converts it into static bags of capital and share price? You know, how has that come to happen? You know, and that's really because central currency is the embedded operating system, right? It was, it was created for a growth economy. It was created so people with money could grow their money by having money. You know, and it was a way of gaming transaction. You know, we talk about, oh, we can gamify that, we can gamify that to make money. The economy was already gamified. Right? This was transaction and value between people that got gamified with central currency into something else. So then the people that want to make money in this game are going to play the game, not be down at the bottom of the, of the totem pole, you know, creating value. That's the sucker's place in this. Right, the place you want to be is up here. That's what General Electric learned, really, in the, in the 90s under Jack Welch. They could sell a washing, ma washing machine to someone and make maybe 20 cents on the dollar, or they could lend money to someone to buy a washing machine and make 40 cents on the dollar. So they sell the washing machine industry, and they become a finance company. You know, and that worked really well until the crash. Right, so what these corporations are doing digital and, and, and pre-digital, is converting land and labor into capital. That's the object of the game. That's what Uber's doing, taking places and people and converting it into money. That's what Airbnb is doing, converting land and labor into capital. Right? So digital companies are really just software created in order to do that. And if you start a digital company and you take any capital at all, now your obligation is to create a home run, a 100x return. 10x return isn't enough. That's a failure. Right? So once you get into that game, you're in that game. So what's the alternative? The alternative is instead of optimizing the economy for growth, we optimize the economy for humans. Right? And this is really hard to think about because it, it forces you to challenge some of your underlying assumptions about what an economy is for. You know, so people that are on our side say, oh, well, we got to figure out how to create more jobs, create more jobs. 
you know, Obama's always on that. Jobs, jobs, jobs. Jobs is good. Jobs is good. And even in our labor thing, we're talking about jobs. Wait a minute. You know, if, let's just be, you know, pretend we're on acid for a minute and say, <laughs> who really wants a job? Right? They're all thinking, the, the YouTube people are thinking, oh, he's talking about being lazy. He's talking about being lazy. No. What do we want? We want food. We want shelter. We want a sense of meaning. We want to contribute to something. But do we want a job? No. We understand that a job is an artifact of a renaissance error scheme to prevent us from creating and exchanging value ourselves. So no, no, no. We don't need to optimize for jobs. And really, we have, certainly in America, we have more than enough stuff. Right? We, have, we burn food every single week in order to keep market prices high. Bank of America is tearing down homes in California that are in foreclosure. Why? To keep market prices high. We can't just let you live in it. Why? Because you don't have a job. You don't have a job. Right, so what are we going to do? We have to create a completely unnecessary industry that now taxes the topsoil or the environment somehow so that, and, and creates worthless goods that we're going to have to market to people and somehow convince them to buy and ruin their lives with them, whatever it is, in order for you to have a job. You know, you're not allowed to share the lawnmower or the snowblower with your neighbor because then you're not making enough snowblowers and there's not enough jobs. Right, that is ass backwards. Right? If there's actually enough stuff, then we really can talk seriously about you know, minimum income and, and really simple ideas. If there's enough food to go around, then why not let people eat it? If there's enough shelter for people to live in, then why not let people live in them? And then if they want to really get a special house or foie gras, whatever the heck they want, you know, let them, sure, they can write video games for other people to play and you know, create another entertainment economy on top of that. You know, so, so, in optimizing for humans, first, you stop looking at jobs. Stuff is way more important than jobs. And when you look at the corporation, so you say, okay, if we want to optimize a corporation for human beings, instead of optimizing it for growth, what do we want to do? Really what we want to do is, is retrieve some of the ideas of, thank you again, Richard, of, of uh, uh, um, John Stuart Mill, who talked about growth is cool, capitalism is cool, until you've grown to the point where the economy has reached its carrying capacity. When you reach your carrying capacity, you move into more of a steady state economy. So then instead of worrying about growth, now you start looking at the circulation of money. You start thinking about it. I mean, gosh, people don't grow forever. You get to six, seven, eight feet, that's enough, right? <laughs> then what do you do? You fucking, you make another one, right? You make another person. You stop growing, even a, a coral reef. Everyone uses these terms ecosystem, oh, the Uber ecosystem, the iTunes e These are not ecosystems because they destroy. Right, ecosystems are sustainable. Uber's not an ecosystem. The people who are driving are doing R&D for automatic cars. That's what they're doing. They're doing the R&D for the technology that will replace them. And because they don't have a, a platform cooperative, they're not going to be included in that. Well, shoot, if they were shareholders, if the drivers even own 10, 20% of that company, then it doesn't matter. Then when the company succeeds after them, they're still participating in the value they created. Right, so a steady state, a steady state corporation would look at uh, the, really the difference between a, a board game and a fantasy role-playing game. Start playing an infinite game with a business. How can this business sustain itself? How can it go on forever even? How can it continue? What's a sustainable business look like? And you see, actually in family businesses, you see some people who are willing to experiment with long-term interest. Family businesses care differently than regular ones do because it's their family name on the thing. They don't want to screw other people over because that's them, their kids, their grandkids are going to have to live with the reputation of what they've done. They're also thinking about their business as the investment. Right? It's not the object is not to collect enough cash in your stock value so that your kids can live off that. It's to create a sustainable enterprise that your kids can continue after you in generation after generation after generation. And family businesses actually do better long term than major corporations do. They don't do as well in sudden uh, expansions. They don't do well in, in extremely speculative moments, but they do much, much better in downturns. And that's because they're embedded in their communities. They're embedded with their, with their vendors. No, and they're even willing, and this is just perish the thought, they're even willing to help others create value. Now, that's the real trick for a business to, to develop an ecosystem. 
It's to think of its vendors and its customers as people that it has to keep alive. Otherwise, you lose them. God, even a fascist like Henry Ford understood that. You know, that you've got to pay your workers enough to buy your product. Otherwise, you're really totally screwed. Right, so you actually help others create value. And what we do is we move from kind of a growth model of business to a flow model of business, where we optimize for the velocity of money. Right? And that's where, you know, that's where some of our, our currency, new currencies are coming in that are thinking about exchange. And I'm more excited really about uh, uh, amplifications of the let systems and time dollars than I am about you know, Bitcoin and the blockchain. Where Bitcoin is... is Terrific in, in, in the sense that now we can authenticate from the periphery. We no longer require a central authority to authenticate. So the whole uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, reasoning behind a central authority, behind a central bank is taken away. Right? The bank wasn't really there to secure our transactions. Right? The bank was actually invented to extract value from our transactions, but they used the idea that they were there to authenticate our transactions as the reason why they took all that money. But now that we can see that we can do this with our cell phones, that rationale is taken away from that argument for their, for their existence and their extractive nature is taken away. But really, you have to ask when you look at Bitcoin, what are they programming for? Right, what are they programming for? Are they programming for velocity of money and for exchange between people? I keep hearing people say that, that you know, Bitcoin, you know, Bitcoin creates trust in a new way. You know, Bitcoin substitutes for trust in a new way. And that's, that's tr a tricky thing. And not, well, but it substitutes for it. And it's not to say the blockchain is a worthless technology. It's not. I mean, PGP wasn't, although it turns out there was something bad in there, but that's another story. You know, PGP was, had that, mole thing in it, whatever, it wasn't really what we thought. Um, but the, the trick for us as enthusiastic digital people is in seeing something like Bitcoin and the blockchain through this kind of techno-solutionist lens, as if what we can do is kind of reprogram a digital economy somehow perfectly so that everything works out. And it just doesn't work. In the end, what we really have to reprogram is our social expectations of one another. What does it mean to engage? You know, everyone on my block is really happy to lend a lawnmower or a snowblower to someone else, but everybody's afraid to accept it. Now, why is that? That's because they're programmed. If you accept a favor from someone else, now you owe something. There's some sort of sense of obligation to another. That's called community. Right, that's a good thing. The reason why we bring brownies and things to people when they move into our neighborhood is not because they need brownies or a meatloaf. <laughs> it's so they have an excuse to pay us back. It's to bring them into the fabric of favors that actually creates a peer-to-peer -peer reality. So what I've been doing, and I hope you guys can do this too, is thinking up and then pitching a variety of experiments, I'm calling them, to the powers that be. Right, convince them that there is some chance, they're all into risk avoidance, risk management, there's some chance that the peer-to-peer -peer kind of a thing we're talking about might actually happen. Right, there's some chance that this extractive, uh, uh, this extractive economy that Deloitte has shown is going away will actually go away. So what they need to do is begin to experiment with hybrid solutions to the problems they already have. So you look at an uh, institution like a bank. What a bank can do to begin to participate in more distributive circulatory models would be, you know, Joe, the pizza, pizzeria owner, wants to borrow $100,000 to expand his restaurant. So the bank should say, rather than we'll give you $100,000 and then you pay it all back or we'll kill you, what they should say is, look, we will lend you $50,000 if you can crowdsource $50,000 from the neighborhood using this secure system that we'll just give you for free as a utility. That's an easy one, right? So now the, the, the pizzeria then just has to ask customers, well, if you give me $100 towards my renovation, you can have $120 worth of pizza when it's done. So the community member gets a 20% return on his money in, in less than a year. The bank gets community buy-in, the pizzeria owner has now established new community relationships, and the bank has also established itself as something other than the extractor of value from a neighborhood, but the facilitator of local transaction and community development. Or you look at a, a company as, as badass as Walmart. What if they took one shelf, right, one shelf in the store and dedicated it to locally produced goods? One shelf. Is that going to threaten the whole thing? No, but it's actually going to help create 
a local economy. I mean, all you have to do to pitch that to Walmart is say that Walmart needs to do economic development in its target communities because the target communities are going bankrupt. They're all on welfare. How can you do that is by stimulating a local economy. Or a supermarket can give over its parking lot to its competitor, to the CSA, the Community Supported Agriculture Group. Do a farmer's market on weekends. Let them rent space from your parking lot if you really have to monetize the damn thing. And then at the end of the day, when they haven't sold all their goods, you can store it on your shelves and then have a, have a great halo of selling locally produced goods. Or you can talk about bounded investing. You know, bounded investing is something the labor unions figured out. The steel workers figured this out. They had all this retirement money. And they figured out, where are we going to invest it? Where are we going to invest it? And someone got the bright idea. Why don't we invest our retirement money in projects that are going to hire steel workers? Duh. Right, isn't that good? So now they take the money and they, they invest it in projects that create jobs for their workers. And then they thought, why can't we do one better and invest it in projects that are steel workers are going to, our union members are going to build them and then actually live in them. So people creating their own homes for money and their own retirement savings. So it's a matter of teaching companies how to earn the same dollar five times in a bounded economy rather than extracting five dollars from the economy and leaving it bankrupt. You know, that's not that hard. You know, startups teach startups to take less money. You know, even the Silicon Valley show on HBO understands that. The less money you take, the more of the company you have and the less you have to pay back. You know, and of course, you know, the, the most exciting one, that one thing that we're talking about today is moving from platform monopolies to platform cooperatives. Actually letting the people who are creating value on your platform own the platform or part of the platform. Get as thin, get the platform as thin as possible, get the app as tiny as possible so that it's facilitating exchange between people rather than extracting from the exchange, which is the only thing that people seem to know how to do. Now, what I'm arguing for, and I think is the only possible uh, uh, turn of events for this kind of stuff to happen, would be if we are living through a full-on renaissance, a renaissance of 12th, 13th century proportion. And I would argue that we are. You know, the, look at the original renaissance. What did they get? They got perspective painting, they circumnavigated the globe, they invented the individual, uh, they Essentially, you know what I mean, the, the self, the Faustus and all that. They got the printing press, they enclosed the commons, and they invented sort of science of division. So what are our, what are our uh, equivalents to those? Okay, perspective. Well, perspective painting did what? It allowed you to see three dimensions on two. What do we have? We have the hologram and the fractal. Right, which basically allow you to see, if you move past a hologram, it allows you to see four dimensions in two. Or a fractal, you get self-similarity, where you begin to see the dimensionality. It's actually fractional dimensionality. You know, and everybody today is talking about, oh, can we have a fractal model of distribution in Bitcoin? Yes, we can, because that's our renaissance. Instead of circumnavigating the globe and, and creating a, a culture of conquest, what did we do? We orbited the globe and took a picture of it, thanks to Stuart Brand. He said, why don't you take a picture of the damn thing? We took a picture of it, and then what did we get? We got the environmental movement, because we realized, oh my gosh, this is one sphere that we're living on. So instead of the individual hero, what did we get? Well, we got, we got collectivism. We got um, uh, fantasy role-playing games. We got collaborative narrative. We got the internet. Instead of the printing press, we got the computer and the net. Instead of enclosing the commons, we end up retrieving the commons and through shareware. Instead of getting a divisional science, we get a science of holism. You know, so I do believe that we can justify this moment as a renaissance. But the beauty of a renaissance is what do you do? Renaissance, you rebirth old forms in a new context. The idea of a renaissance is that it, it retrieves the values that got repressed the last time out. So what got repressed the last time out? Peer-to-peer, -peer, community, the land. You know, for what? For centralization, for, for empire. That was what the Renaissance, that was literally what was reborn, was the values of ancient Roman Greece. So what do we rebirth? We rebirth the values of the peer-to-peer -peer bizarre culture. You know, and we see little cultural hints of that. That's what we're seeing in Burning Man. That's what we're seeing in steampunk. That's what we're seeing in Etsy and crafts and home-brewed beers and all. You know, there's, it's as if we were retrieving medieval culture right along with medieval economic values. And the people who actually talked the most coherently about this were the Catholics. Go figure. The, the, 
the popes were asked for a response, really, to Marxism. And they were kind of between a rock and a hard place. They didn't want to go with the Marxists, and they didn't want to go with the capitalists. They saw there was sort of, it's great, their right to the individual laborer, that's kind of good, but people should be free to make money and, and, and invest and do all that too. And they came up with, a, with something that was later called distributism, which really meant that rather than worrying about redistributing the spoils after the fact, what we have to do is distribute the means of production to people. Right? So the shoemaker can own his shoemaking stuff. Right? Or the Uber driver can own part of the platform, although they didn't call it, they didn't know about platform monopolies back then. And the other big idea they had, they called subsidiarism, which meant that no business really needs to be bigger than it needs to be. Right? That businesses should only grow as they need to in order to accomplish the task that they need to accomplish. And after that, let someone else do it. Right? You only need to grow to a certain size to be, to be sustainable. You know, and these values, which actually Francis is hinting at again, it's like he's, he's read it, these values really couldn't be fully realized until we had a digital distributed technology in order to realize them. You know, and that's the promise of a digital economy. It's not the runaway amplified growth of digital industrialism, right? But the, the sustainable creative capacity of digital distributism, which is really what platform cooperative cooperatives are leaning towards. You know, the, the factors of production have always, we've always understood the factors of production as land, labor, and capital, and sometimes entrepreneurial effort. Land, labor, and capital, though, are the biggies. And right now we're living in an economy that rewards capital, but what about the land and labor? What about the neighborhoods where Airbnb is operating? What about the people who are driving the Uber cars? Right, the opportunity we have in a renaissance of this proportion is to retrieve land and labor right, and to put them right alongside capital as partners in an economy, which is what they are. It's really not fair for the people who are putting the money in to reap all the value because money is not the only energy that is, is not the only factor of production that we're seeing, that we're seeing uh, uh, in, our, in our economy. You know, the beauty of being in places like this, and I really do like coming together as live, as live humans. The beauty is that in the real world, as opposed to online, in the real world, human beings have the home field advantage. We actually do. This is why corporations of the industrial era are so happy to go online, because we no longer have the advantage there. We're not there. We don't have our flesh. We don't have our reality. We don't have all the stuff, all the solidarity, solidarity that is created by humans in real space together. You know, so I believe that our opportunity as humans who want to redirect the economy towards human ends rather than the needs of abstracted capital that's serving nobody, you know, is to reboot the economy itself for distributed prosperity. And we can do that one person, one business at a time. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>